here we are, Micah chapter 7. We're going to be looking at and concluding uh, Micah by looking at chapter 7. So I'll read verses 1 and 2, and we'll get into our study tonight. Micah chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Woe is me, for I am like those who gather summer fruits, like those who glean vintage grapes. There is no cluster to eat of the first ripe fruit, which my soul desires. The faithful man has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among men. They all lie and wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net. Okay, let's do a review. You know, uh, let's remember what we've looked at and lead up to chapter 7. We know that God has just stated that the nation is in rebellion, and God has just stated that, uh, that Israel's judgment is justified. And he had asked the question, he said, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? And he went on to say to them, testify against me. He is saying, if you have a complaint against me, now is your opportunity to lodge it. And that's why he said, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? But he went on to remind the nation of how gently and lovingly he had he had delivered them from Egypt, how he had referred to the, their time in Egypt as being a deliverance from a house of bondage. He reminded them of how Moses and Aaron and, and Miriam had, had been given to the nation, Moses representing the law and Aaron representing the priesthood and Miriam representing uh, prophecy and, and worship. And he said, I had given you these three and they were gifts to you to help you to have relationship with me. And still, even though he had done that for them, they were still in rebellion against him. He reminds them that while they were on their way to the land of promise, that the people had actually sinned against him. There was a false prophet, and we looked at this false prophet last time we were together. His name is Balaam. And he was counseling a king by the name of Balak. And the way he counseled Balak in order to get the children of Israel to receive judgment from God, is he, he counseled them to, uh, to introduce to the Jewish men the pagan women of Moab. Now it's interesting, and I'll look at this with you and, and remind you of a few, a few things in a moment, but it's interesting that this man Balaam is actually mentioned three times in the New Testament. Balaam, this man found in Numbers 22 through 24 specifically, is mentioned in the New Testament also as a, an object lesson, as an example of what not to be. So when you look at Balaam in the New Testament, you'll see him, for example, in 2 Peter in chapter 2, verse 15. It says, They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, and there here's his sin, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Because the king had been promising Balaam a, a, a lot of money if you would only curse the nation of Israel, and so it's referred to by Peter as the wages of unrighteousness. Then when you look in Jude, the book of Jude, verse 11, it says, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. And so once again, it's mentioned that he, he was a, a greedy man who desired profit. So Balaam was greedy, and because of this, he committed great sin and he led others into that also. The third time that Balaam is mentioned in the New Testament is in Revelation chapter 2. And in Revelation 2 verse 14, it says, I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. And here's the doctrine or the teaching, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. And so the sin is presented to us. He, was, he taught error, he was greedy, and what he taught them to do was to have unlawful sexual intercourse. You see, Balaam knew that God was a righteous God, and he knew that God would punish disobedience. God had told him, you cannot bring a curse against the, the ones whom I have not cursed. And so when Balak originally had approached Balaam and said, I want you to bring a curse against the nation of Israel, uh, he had said, no, I can't do that. I cannot curse those whom God has not cursed. 
And that's when the argument began with Balak saying to him, I would have made you a very, very rich man if you would only have done that which I'm telling you to do. I'd have paid you handsomely to do this. And so that greed, the desire to be able to get the money drove this man on. You see, he knew that he couldn't bring a, a curse against Israel, but he also knew that Israel could bring judgment on herself. And so his counsel was to introduce seduction because in doing so, God would judge them himself. You see, God had forbidden Israel from marrying heathens in order that they might safeguard their relationship with him. All the way in the book of Exodus, in, in chapter 34, verses 12 through 15, we read, Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you're going, lest there be a snare in your midst. But you shall destroy their altars, break down, break their sacred pillars, cut down their wooden images, for you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifice to their gods. And one of them invites you, and you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters play the harlot with their gods, and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. So God, all the way in the early portion of his deliverance of the nation of Israel, giving of the law, was saying, you are forbidden to have this kind of relationship with pagans. He repeats it in, in Deuteronomy in chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, where he says, nor shall you make marriages with them, with the pagans. You shall not give your daughters to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. Why? They will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. So God had given them a warning. And he had said, do not have relationships with these pagan women. And so Balaam knew that though he could not curse the nation of Israel, he couldn't bring a curse against them. He knew that God would judge them himself. And thus he gave the advice to Balak and said, just bring out your hot chicks. That's in the Hebrew. <laughs> and, uh, and then God will judge them himself. Now that's what Jesus is referring to in the book of Revelation when he's speaking there in chapter 2. That's what he's referring to when he speaks of putting a stumbling block and introducing idolatry and sexual immorality. You see, in the book of Numbers, in chapter 25, verses 1 through 3, uh, it reads, Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of the gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. And that's how they were able to be judged, and that's how this prophet would make his financial profit. So God said, I delivered you from bondage, but you have had a bent towards rejection and rebellion throughout your history. And so what are you to do? Well, you're to do justly. You're to love mercy. You're to walk humbly with me. But they refused to do that. Instead, they pillaged the poor, they were greedy, they practiced idolatry, and God rightly was going to judge them for that. God is a righteous judge. And even as it says in Psalm 51, verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And so God was going to bring, and as we have seen, he's going to bring judgment against the nation of Israel. So here in chapter 7, in this final chapter, Micah is confessing that God is just in his judgment. He's agreeing that God is accurate in his complaint against Israel, but it causes him sorrow to have to say that. Notice how he says it in verse 1 of chapter 7. Woe is me! For I am like those who gather summer fruits, like those who glean vintage grapes. There is no cluster to eat of the first ripe fruit, 
which my soul desires. He begins by saying, woe is me. I'm grieved. I'm grieved that I have to speak these things. I'm overwhelmed because I have to give this message. Never, never fail to remember that when the full counsel of God goes out, that sometimes the message is tough. And sometimes the message cuts to people's hearts. I have a very, a very dear friend, Raul Reese, and I can still remember how one of the assistants, one of his pastors was sharing with me how that he had seen Raul before Raul was going out to preach a, a message. He had seen Raul as he was shaking his head in the back saying, I just don't want to say this. I just don't want to have to teach this. You know, sometimes we have courageous ministers who will stand up and speak the truth and it can be cutting and, and uh, people may think uh, how easy it is for that person to say that, but it isn't. When you have to bring a word of correction, especially in the context of proclaiming the message of God, it is never a pleasant thing to do. It's always a grievous thing to do. It's always one of those things that causes you pain. You know, I remember a long time ago, one of my uh, Bible professors in Bible college was pointing out that, that the, the best way to preach a message that is one of bringing judgment is with tears. And that's the truth. There, there needs to be a sense of grieving along with those who are receiving the message, and that's how he's beginning here. Listen, if a person giving a message grieves along with those who receive it, there's going to be a compassion and a mercy. There's going to be a love. There's going to be something there that is part of that proclamation that will cause the people to know that the one who's speaking to them and the message being given to them is, is uh, one of compassion and love and one that's intended to draw people to a place of repentance. And, and that's how he's saying, he's saying, woe is me, woe is me. There's no joy in bringing this message. And it tears him because it's speaking of severe judgment. And you'll see that. He says, I am, in verse 1, I'm like, like those who gather summer fruits, like those who glean vintage, uh, vintage grapes. Now, when he's speaking of that, we need to remember that, that grape vines represent the nation of Israel. And you see that very clearly, especially in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. So Micah is saying that he has looked for good fruit in the nation, but has found none. The vine is simply not producing any fruit, and it is ready for judgment. In verse 2, he says, The faithful man has perished from the earth. There is no one upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net. So it, the faithful man has perished. They've rejected God. They've rejected his word. And so because they rejected God and rejected God's word, evil and violence becomes the norm. And he says the faithful man is nowhere to be found. There's not a single upright man anywhere in the land. Sin has so permeated the nation that goodness no longer can be discovered. Think about that for a moment. Evil has so penetrated the nation of Israel that no matter where you look, you can't find a single good person. It has so permeated. It has become so much the norm. It has become so normal that anybody who would speak against it will be looked at as being out of touch with reality. It is so normal to be evil that Micah says, I can't find an upright man anywhere. There's none to be found. That reminds me of Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 29 and 30, where it says, the people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, mistreated the poor and needy. They wrongfully oppressed the stranger. And God says, so I sought for a man among them who would make a wall, stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. There wasn't anybody who would stand up. Remember this, it's just so basic, but let me say it like this. Uh, I've said this in different ways over the, over the years, but any dead fish can go with the flow of the river 
It takes a live fish to go against it. And what the Lord is looking for is for someone to stand up, to stand in the gap. He still is, by the way. The eyes of the Lord are still running to and fro throughout the land looking for one man whose heart is completely his. And God is determined that he can use that man. But as Micah is looking around here, he says, I don't see one. I don't see a single person. The faithful man has perished from the earth. There is no one upright among them. Not a single good person, not a single righteous man, not one person who is actually living for the Lord. He says in verse 3, that they may successfully do evil with both hands. The prince asks for gifts. The judge seeks a bribe, and the great man utters his evil desire. So they scheme together. They're not satisfied doing evil halfway. They are completely given over to it. That's what it means in verse 3, verse 1, uh, verse 3, where it says that they may successfully do evil with both hands. They're not willing to do evil. It's kind of like if I went to the store and I was stealing, I wouldn't be content just using one hand to steal. I'm using both hands. I'm fully committed. And that's the picture that he's giving, giving here, that they may successfully do evil with both hands. And it speaks of the prince asking for gifts and a judge seeking a bribe. And the great man uttering evil desire, and they're scheming together. They're creating a, an atmosphere where this is acceptable. We can look at that for just a moment. I want you to see how they're doing evil for personal profit. They're selling out government and justice because of their greed. And then notice how it says, the great man utters his evil desire, so they scheme together. Now, when it says the great, that word great in the original language in Hebrew can speak of an elder, but it is also spoken of someone who is important or who is distinguished. So the elder, the important or distinguished man, utters his evil desire. The word utters means he makes pronouncements. So this important man is making pronouncements, is what he's saying. Public opinion has been formed, but not by righteous people, but by the popular people. They work with the government. They work with the judges. They're influencing the way of thinking of the nation. Now, when you're reading your Bible, you may be thinking, man, this book was written thousands of years ago. Those things may have been so then, but they're not so now. Or are they? Or are they? When it speaks of a prince asking for gifts, that's government. When it speaks of the judge seeking a bribe, that's the law. When it speaks concerning the elder, the great man uttering, that's the philosopher. And so what you have is you have an atmosphere that makes evil acceptable because it is promoted by those who are regarded as the greatest and most intellectual. Today, we see that in our public universities. We see that through many of the authors who write the things that they do. We know that our society is influenced by our songwriters and poets. And we know that people will make decisions based on what celebrities tell them is truth. So is it possible that we are the same kind of people just removed by a few, several centuries? And the answer is, of course. Human nature is the same now as it was then. When you get away from the truth of the word of God and begin, and begin to create your own philosophies and ways of thinking that do not regard or have fear of God in them, you ultimately are going to create a system that rejects him and is polluted and condemned by God. That's a fact. That's just a fact. And that's what we have today. Often uh, in, our, in our society, and there are books written about this, I'm just kind of touching on this briefly. Often in our society today, and we know this, biblical morality is ridiculed. And what was at one time known to be immorality is now simply called love. And that's what's taken place. And people, people have, in general, 
not every person, but many people in general have a disregard for things that are right. Even in the simplest things, I mean, you can see through the general lack of courtesies that this society has to this day, we, we have a lack of courtesy and nobody here would argue against that. I don't think. If you do, you're discourteous. No, uh, <laughs> nobody would, would argue that people have lost a sense of, uh, of, uh, of just general courtesies to people. I mean, you'll stand in line and there'll be people who will push in front of you. I mean, these, these, um, these sales that go on and they, what do they call them, Black, what are they, Black, Black Friday? I wouldn't go out there, man, you know, without an armed guard. I mean, you see them fighting over, over things, you know that. And some of you have seen, some of you have come to church on Sunday with black guys. I know where you were. <laughs> but you see that, and, and, and it happens throughout the Christmas holiday season, right? I mean, people getting mad and uptight and cussing people out because they're buying their Christmas gifts. <laughs> and it doesn't make sense to me at all. And so, I mean, it isn't hard to begin to make a case for discourtesy in, this, in, this, uh, in the United States. Um, it isn't hard to make a case for people uh, not having a sense of propriety or decency. That's not hard at all. I, I, I find it interesting to see what takes place. And, and the convoluted, the convoluted methodologies in terms of, uh, of, of uh, thinking this is right and this is wrong, even recently, uh, as just a, a contemporary example, even recently, um, all of us who watch the news, read the newspaper, or somehow gain uh, you know, news through various sources, all of us know that this particular play, Hamilton, all of us heard of what took place when the vice president-elect uh, Mike Pence went in with his family or whatever to go and see a play He's an American. He has the right to go and see a play, I'd assume. And yet you have to have the guy, what's his name, Brandon Victor Dixon, who is playing the part of Vice President Aaron Burr. You have him standing on the lip of the stage lecturing the Vice President-elect concerning his fear and the fear of many people and all, and, and that's improper. That's just flat out improper. That is just wrong. Yes, we live in the United States, and yes, we have a right to our own opinions. But we also need to know that there is a time and place for everything. And that man deserves his time off. And if it were somebody else who was there, if it was the shoe was on another foot and it was a Democrat, I'd be still saying the same kind of thing. It's the wrong thing to do. You just don't do that. It's improper to do something like that. But the lecture was one based on ethics and morality. And he was lecturing him on ethics and morality. And yet, you know, this is, this is the era that we live in. People say, well, listen, if Brandon Victor Dixon is concerned about ethics and morality, then why is it that he was tweeting things that were sexual, racist, and, and uh, against, uh, uh, why, uh, against women? Why did he do that and nobody said anything about that? And so what happens today, which he did, and it's easy to find his tweets. All you need to do is look up his name, and uh, the almighty Google will, will lead you there. Brandon Victor Dixon, and look up his tweets. And the, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm just telling you that's what I did. And uh, he, they're, they're, they're terrible. They're dirty. Nobody's saying anything about that, though, right? Nobody says anything about that. Why? Why isn't anybody saying anything? Because... What he said flows with the contemporary way of thinking. That's why. And people accept that. He says, I have nothing to apologize for. And there are people who agree with him. And so when this is being said, listen again, that they may successfully do evil with both hands. The prince asks for gifts. The judge seeks a bribe. Great man utters evil desire. They scheme together, they're creating an atmosphere with this kind of behavior is appropriate and acceptable. He says in verse 4, the best of them is like a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman and your punishment comes, now shall be their perplexity. So 
the best of them, the best writers, the best leaders, the best philosophers, he says, are like briars and thorns. In other words, you need to avoid them because they'll injure you. He is saying they provide nothing of eternal value and you should not allow them to influence your life. He goes on to say the day of your watchman and your punishment comes. In other words, judgment is coming and you will be confused when it actually takes you. You're not expecting it, but it will take you. Judgment is coming. In verse 5, do not trust in a friend. Do not put your confidence in a companion. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom. For son dishonors father. Daughter rises against her mother. Daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Do not trust in a friend. Don't put your confidence in a companion. Guard the doors of your lips, your mouth. So that's a warning to be discerning in the midst of evil times. There are those who pretend to be friends, but they can't be trusted. There are some who pretend to be your helper or your guide, whether it be a judge, a politician, or even a relative, but they really aren't there to help you. So he's saying, be careful who you confide in, even with your own wife who may betray you. And that's why I don't tell Marie anything he says, for son dishonors father, daughter rises against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Even close family ties have no guarantee that there is genuine love and faithfulness to be found. Now, what's interesting, when he speaks in this way and he's saying, guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom and all, in his day, if you said something against an official, you could be turned in by your own family. That's why Ecclesiastes 10 verse 20 says, do not revile the king even in your thoughts or curse the rich in your bedroom because a bird in the sky may carry your words and a bird on the wing may report what you say. So be careful, guard the lips, guard your mouth. He says in verse six, because the son dishonors his father and the daughter dishonors her mother. Now this was taking place in Micah's day. But it also, remember with me, takes place in the latter days. Remember in Matthew 10, verses 34 through 36, how Jesus said, Do not think that I come to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. And so what was taking place during the time of Micah is something that also takes place later. Therefore, verse 7, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. And I love this. My God will hear me. My God will hear me. With all of this going on, with all of this treachery, with me not being able to put confidence in man, with me not even be able, being able to even trust my wife in such a circumstance that Micah's warning the people about, there is somebody that I can trust. There is somebody that is trustworthy. And the answer to that is I can trust my God. So instead of losing hope, my hope is more concentrated on the one that I can trust. Remember this always, and I don't think I have to tell you this. You already know this, but man does let us down. That's just a fact. No matter how, no matter how much effort you make in being a great person, no matter how you die to yourself on a daily basis, no matter if you get up in the morning and you say, God, help me. I want to be a good person today. You have opportunity, and we'll see this a little clearer in just a moment, but you have opportunity throughout your day to fail. And I cannot tell you, you know, over the years, of how many people I have hurt. And maybe there's some in this room that I have hurt without intending, of course, but, but I know I have. I know I have. And if, if not in ministry, of course, in life, whether it be hurting a mom, my mom, or my dad, or a brother, a sister, or a friend, you know, you don't want to. It's not like you wake up in the morning and you say, let's see, who can I hurt the most today? Who loves me the most? Okay, then I'll do this. You don't do that. Most of us don't. And so even in ministry, you know, people can look at their pastor 
and, and they can love their pastor and and they can and 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 all but the pastor can the pastor can fail because because men men do because men fail men can disappoint even the most loving even the most caring can sometimes not be kind or say something that may hurt even if they don't intend to it can slip out and it can hurt and people can get disappointed and people can get emotionally wrought over that and and they think i thought you loved me i thought you cared how could you you know i i don't think that i'm here trying to make any excuses for any behavior that i've ever had but i will tell you this i do know that i fail but i'm not alone in this room we all do we all have not because we wanted to not because we tried to well perhaps sometimes we did want to sometimes we did try to but not by habit not by purple desire and so a long time ago a long time ago i came to realize i came to realize that that i can't put full confidence in a human being as if they're god because they're not there's only one that i can put full confidence in and that's that is god that is god and so you know my pastor was chuck smith and pastor chuck i knew pastor chuck for a long long time and in the last several years of his life i served with him on on a board served with him on a council i taught in front of him many 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 times i don't know how many times i taught in front of my pastor I, I traveled with him to Israel, traveled with him on this, in, in the Mediterranean. I, I did conferences with him in Europe, uh, conferences with him in Anaheim, I, just various places in the East Coast. I mean, I was with my pastor a lot. And, and, and there were times, you know, that, that, that he may not have been as, as talkative as, as I would have liked him to have been and, and even made me feel awkward. I can still remember sitting at a table with him. We were in, on a cruise and he had asked me and our church and to go to Alaska and we did. We went on Alaska cruise with him and several other pastors and, and we we're there and I was at the table with him and Pastor Chuck was seated right next to me and, and I'm just kind of sitting next to him and this is my pastor and I love him. And, uh, and I had been told, you know, that this was many years ago and I had been told, you know, Chuck, if he doesn't feel like talking, he won't talk. I said, oh, whatever. And I was sitting next to him, and I turned to him, and I started to speak to him, and he looked at me, said a couple words, then went, went about eating his dessert. And I just kind of sat there very awkwardly thinking, well, the man doesn't want to talk to me at all. You know, I wish I was a blueberry pie. He'd be talking to me, <laughs> you know. So, you know, it, that, that's what happens. So when you, when, you, when you put somebody on a pedestal, be very careful because the higher they go up, the farther they will fall. Just look at them as human beings. Look at them as just normal people. Look at me that way. Uh, this sounds so self-serving, you know, but I have had people in this church who actually shake when they're talking to me. That's a fact. That, that's a fact, that their hands are shaking. And I'll say, why are, you, why are you doing that? I don't know. I've never talked to you before. And I say, you know what? Ain't no biggie. Ain't no biggie. You know, please don't. I have people who apologize to me. I'll be in a restaurant. They'll come up and apologize. Excuse me, I'm sorry to bother you, Pastor. I go to your church. And I'll say, that doesn't bother me at all. And I'm glad you do. And you're not bothering me now. I have people who walk up to me and they'll say things like, I, I'm sorry to take your time. And I always say the same thing. You don't take my time. I give my time. It's okay. That's what I'm here for. But I can disappoint. And I do, and I have, and I will in the future. That's not some excuse to be a jerk next Sunday. <laughs> it's just a fact. It's just a fact. But there is one person, and, that, and that's like, oh, how spiritual. But it's true, who will never disappoint. That's the Lord. And I really, really believe that. Yes, amen. <laughs> In Psalm 56, verse 11, Psalm 56, 11, in God I have put my trust. 
I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Psalm 118, verse 6, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Hebrews 13, 6, We may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God, he says, will hear me. My Lord will be with me no matter what. He goes on in verse 8, Do not rejoice over me, my enemy, when I fall. I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. He will bring me forth to the light. I will see his righteousness. Then she who is my enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where's the Lord your God? My eyes will see her. Now she will be trampled down like mire in the streets. So do not rejoice over me, my enemy, when I fall. Now I'm not faultless. I will fail at times, but God will raise me up. It says in Proverbs 24, 16, though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. But the wicked are brought down by calamity. He's saying, I sit in darkness. I may find myself unable to navigate my way, but God will light up my path before me. Like it says in Psalm 18, 28, you will light my lamp. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. That's a fact. We are not faultless. We do fail. But though I fall seven times, God raises me up. We need to remember that. I, I encourage people about this quite often. I, I believe so strongly in the grace of God and the restoring power of God. I believe that God is a God who gives you not a second chance or a third chance. He gives you chance after chance after chance after chance. You know, because we fail and we fail and we fail and we fail. And that is not permission to continue to fail. It's just an awareness of my frailty. I am made of dust. I am frail. And I have a sin nature. But my God loves me. And my God loves you too. And isn't that good? That to me. It's an amazing thing how God loves us. It really is. So, yeah, you're walking and it can be dark, but God lights your path. You seek him. He says in verse 9, I'll bear the indignation of the Lord because I've sinned against him, but he pleads my case. Again, Micah identifies with the people. And as one who identifies with the people, he confesses his sins as well as his shortcomings. You see the nations being judged. He's enduring the judgment of God along with them. He hadn't sinned in the way that they had, but he lives under the same conditions that they do. One of the things when I was, uh, I was a freshman in Bible college, and um, my professor was teaching us there at Biola, he was teaching us the book of uh, Daniel, and he got to chapter 9. And one of the lessons I learned as a, a freshman in Bible college that I've kept with me my whole life, and this is something that perhaps some of you might want to remember too, because this, I, I've, I've had this in my heart for 43 years, since I was 23. When Daniel, in chapter 9, began to pray, he had been reading the book of Jeremiah, and as he read the book of Jeremiah, he discovered that God had stated he was going to judge the nation of Israel for 70 years. And as Daniel was reading, chap you know, as Daniel was reading that, it's recorded in chapter 9, that Daniel began to pray and said, God, we have sinned. When you read the book of Daniel, one of the unique features about the book of Daniel as though he is a man who sins, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He was not a perfect man. But when you read the book of Daniel, I encourage you to read the book of Daniel, it's a powerful book. But when you read the book of Daniel, you will notice that nowhere throughout the entire book is it ever stated that he sinned. It's not, it, it, there's not a sin that is mentioned that's attributed to Daniel through the whole book. Not a single time does it say Daniel lied, Daniel stole, 
Daniel, nothing. And yet, he says, we have sinned. And my professor said this. He said, for those of you who want to be used by God, always identify with the people that you minister to. You're no better than they. You're, as, you're in need of God's grace as much as they. And never put yourself above the people. I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten that. One of, the, one of the things that can cause me to stumble is when I hear a preacher say, when are you guys going to get it? When are you going to get it? My mama used to say that to me. She'd say, when are they going to get it, David? And I would smile at my mama, and I'd say, as soon as I do. I said, the fact is, mama, we never really do get it. And when we finally do, we say, I finally got you die. <laughs> you don't even get to finish your sentence. None of us, none of us is any better than anybody else in this room. None of us. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We all need his grace. And if you're going to be used by God, you need to identify with the people that you minister to. You can't put yourself above them because you're just as much in need of God as they are. And when you understand that, when you understand that, God can use you. But if we have this attitude like, that is so basic, when are you going to figure that one out? There's no humility in your heart. There's no identification with the people. And so Micah is simply identifying with the people and making it very clear that he too is a sinner in need of the grace of God. Now, he pleads, you know, he says, until he pleads my case and executes justice for me and that he will bring me forth to the light. Well, ultimately in their day, Assyria, the nation of Assyria came and took them captive. But ultimately, Micah did enjoy the light of God's freedom and he did walk freely in him. In verse 10, when it says, she who is my enemy will see and shame will cover her who said to me, where is the Lord your God? My eyes will see her. She will be trampled down like mire in the street. When the nation was taken captive, the enemies taunted them, asked, where is your God? Well, God is still God, even when he seems to be distant. God is with us and God does triumph over his enemies. Like it says in Psalm chapter 2, Verses 1 through 6, where the psalmist said, Why do the nations rage? Why do the people waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they cry. Free ourselves from this slavery. But the one who rules in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then in anger he rebukes them, terrifying them with his fierce fury. For the Lord declares, I have placed my chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem, my holy city. God is with us, and he does triumph over his enemies. In verse 11, the day when your walls are to be built, in that day the decree shall go far and wide. In that day they shall come to you from Assyria to the fortified cities, from the fortress to the river, from sea to sea, and mountain to mountain. Yet the land shall be desolate because of those who dwell in it and for the fruit of their deeds. So this is a picture of the distant future when they're once again in their land. It's also a picture of when Messiah ultimately will rule and reign. And we've already seen that the people will stream in to worship the Lord, but the time is yet in the future. So for some time, the land will be desolate. It will be desolate because of their sin. In verse 14, shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your heritage who dwell solitarily in a woodland in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in days of old, as in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt. I will show them marvelous things. So Micah begins to pray that the Lord will care for the people, that he will feed them and that he will nurture them. Notice how verse 15 speaks of the days when you came out of the land of Egypt. I will show marvelous things. He's, he's just mentioning the fact that God delivered the people powerfully with miracles. And once again, God is going to reveal his power. 
And finally, in verse 16 following, the nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall put their hand over their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall crawl from their holes like snakes of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of you. Who is God like you? Hardening iniquity, passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to, to Jacob, mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to, your, to, to uh, our fathers from days of old. And so we roll to a conclusion with a couple of things. In verses 16 and 17, when God brings them back in the last days, the world will be amazed, is what he's saying, and will realize their own weakness. But when he goes into verses 18 through 20, and I want to close with this, this is so beautiful and so powerful. Who is a God like you? Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity, passing over the transgression of the remnant. Who is a God like you? Let's, let's, let's remember something. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It's by grace that you're saved through faith, and not out of yourselves. It's a gift to God, not by works, lest any man should boast. Who is a God like you? What set me free, and I'll close with almost, not a testimony, but just an observance, an observation. What set me free? What set me free? From a religious mentality that I had to work for my own salvation to a free mentality that my works didn't add anything to my salvation. The gospel of Jesus Christ that presents to you and presents to me a gracious, loving, and forgiving God. On the face of the earth, if you were to look at the way gods are on the face of the earth to this day, all you need to do is look at some of the religions of the earth today and see what kinds of people are following these gods, the ones who murder children and murder others, crucify people. And, and that shows you something of the God that they worship because what you worship, you become like. That's why Jesus said that love was the mark of a believer because God so loved the world that he gave. That's why Jesus would say, greater love has no man than this, than a man laid down his life for his friends. That's why Jesus would say, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's why the Bible in the New Testament is so powerful, because it reveals to us that there's not a single thing I can do to save myself. So who is a God like you? Who's a God like you? When I finally realized that I couldn't save myself, but, but there's one who, I'm still amazed that, that, that would actually say, and in his word he does, God so loved the world, that includes me. He is saying, I love you. Do you, here's where the problem is for a lot of people. Do you, do you know he loves you? Do you know that? I can't say that with enough passion because I know a lot of Christians who are still trying to make God love them. Let me tell you, he loves you. He loves you. Now, he didn't like some of the dumb things you do. It's called sin. He sent his son to die to set you free from it. It's killing you. But he loves you. He loves you. My kids taught me something of the love of God in this way, 
even though they did some dumb things, and they still can. And even though my grandbabies can do some things that, oh, can get me a little bothered, I have never stopped loving them. And I want to bless them. And I'm an evil father and an evil grandfather. And if I then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to my children, how much more so will my heavenly father give the spirit to me if I but ask? God is a God that is unique. Listen, if you, if you just followed the evolutionary mentality that the United States is ingrained with, and you began to think in terms of the survival of the fittest, and you began to ask yourself, if you were to look just at, at life in general, is there, is there not a principle that the smaller is preyed on by the greater? And indeed it is, there is something like that. The small fish is just hanging around, the bigger fish comes and eats it, the big fish burps and starts to float away, and then the bigger fish comes and eats that, and that's the way it works. And then some guy throws in the hook and he pulls out that fish and eats that. And that's the way it is. If you're walking in the jungle and a bear comes and you've got no gun and no way, you're dead. Because the bigger is going to destroy the lesser. That's life. We know that. Go swimming with some sharks and then argue with me. <laughs> that's just a fact. The more powerful preys on the weaker, right? So the God I worship is the God of all power. Logic tells me that he'd have to destroy me because he's the greater. I'm the weaker. And what is mind-boggling is this powerful, all-powerful God, instead of destroying me, loves me and saved me. That's amazing. Amen. Amen. That, see, we don't get it. What kind of God do you worship? Who is a God like you? No wonder Mike is speaking like that. All this judgment, all this, but you are a righteous God, and you will deliver us. And who is like you? Pardoning iniquity. You take my sin, and you drop it in the deepest part of the sea. You put a, a sign, no fishing. It's not going to be brought up again. Imagine that. It's all under the blood of Jesus Christ. All under the blood. When you, when you got saved, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleansed you from all sin. Even the sin that you have a tough time forgiving yourself for. God forgave you. And if you can, if you can accept that, you are born again. Your life changes. Your life changes. There's a scripture, Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I love that, and I say this often. As far as the east is from the west, you have a globe. Start in the center and go west. And you will always go west. But if you go from the center and you go north, eventually you'll go south. So God didn't say as far as the north is from the south. He said as far as the east is from the west. Why? Because the east and the west will never reconnect. It never reconnects. Your sin is that far away from you. And that's why the amazing promise, if anyone is in Christ, is a new creation, Yes, that's why it's so amazing. You're born again, brand new, not just rebuilt, but brand new in Christ. You're born again, and you are loved, and you are forgiven. And that's why I just, I just thank God. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever. Because he delights in mercy, he will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. And then he finally says, and you will give truth to Jacob, mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. 
Your promises to Jacob and Abraham are sure. And you will keep your word to us. And that is why it is so important for us to know God's word. Because his promises are there that we can hold fast to. And he's saying, I will keep my word. I have taken you from the guttermost and have loved you to the uttermost. And that's what the Lord does.